A new school day begins in Nepal, but the students are destined for very different classes. <laughs> Education is prized, yet basic quality schools remain out of reach for thousands of Nepali children, especially girls. But one man believes he's changing that through low-cost private education. This is the very cheap education, uh, cheap, cheap, cheap school. I'm Ella Callan. This week on 101 East, we go inside Nepal's classrooms and ask, will so-called bamboo schools close the vast education gap in one of the poorest countries in the world? I'm 13 years and I live in Kathmandu with my mom. I'm reading Samatha High School and I'm from class 8. I want to be a doctor when I finish my school. I want to help the people who are very poor and the uneducated people. I feel that I am the lucky OS one to study in this school. Namaste. Namaste sir. Good morning. Namaste, sir. How are you all? Pema Sherpa has big dreams, the kind once reserved for children from wealthy backgrounds. But her classes take place in a school made of bamboo. Inside the tiny, cramped classrooms of the Samata Shiksha Nikitan School, Pema and her classmates are getting far more than a standard education. The school's name means education for all. I study in English in my classroom. All of our book is in English, not in Nepali, so we have to study in English. One by two. One by two. My mother is so poor, yeah, and so I have to study hard. I'm also the citizen of this country, and I, if I read hard, then I can develop my countries forward, like other countries like America, China. So that's why I want to study hard. We've come to find out why this model of low-cost private schooling has become so popular, and whether the vision held by Uttam Sanjal, the founder of the Bamboo Schools, can be replicated across the country. Nepal was in the grip of a decade of civil war between Maoist insurgents and the army when Uttam built his first school in 2001. He wanted to provide English classes for poor children who were unable to access high-cost private schools. And it's grown into an empire. Okay, let's start PD, PD number one, one. Once an aspiring Bollywood actor, Uttam's stage is now the morning assembly at any of his 19 schools. Where students are taught to sing songs about peace and improving the country. Uttam admits his own education in the government school system was poor. More than half of adults in Nepal cannot read or write. In this uh, government school and private school, between these two, two, the big gap is there. So this bamboo school, this Samatha school, try to fulfill this gap. And it appears to be working. He has a good quality team of teachers and last year's crop of graduates all scored distinctions in their final exams. I have a very big number of kids, 25,000 kids nowadays. I have a 19 branches in a 19 different districts. So people are really, really happy to sending here kids. This is the very cheap education, uh, cheap, cheap, cheap school. Is it good or bad to eat meat? What do you think? Good. Cheap is one reason that Samata schools have become the largest network of non-government schools in Nepal. 
each student pays the same amount, 100 rupees a month to go to the bamboo school, just over a dollar, and about the cost of a kilogram of vegetables here in Nepal. It's made private school accessible for poor kids, but it's also led many to ask, where's the rest of the funding coming from? Whereas they just funded. Bimal Fnuyal is from ActionAid, a non-governmental organisation working to end poverty in Nepal through education. He's also Uttam Sanjal's former school teacher. That hundred rupees which they are paying, actually that cannot run the school. So definitely he has been able to gather resources from elsewhere. So that's why my point is, as we say, there is no free lunch. Uh, there, uh, free school, uh, there cannot be free school. The point is, who invests in that? He agrees that the success of the bamboo schools is remarkable, but he sees it as a temporary solution and doesn't think it's viable to replicate this model of education across Nepal. If we say right to education, that means uh, it's uh, public responsibility, so public education must be strengthened. If parents want to contribute and make it better, that's fine with me. But we cannot leave it entirely to the market, private sector, no. Uttam admits the one dollar a month fee barely covers 25% of his operating costs. The rest comes from private donors. Do you publish who your donors are? Because some people would say you're building a big empire here, so they would like to know uh, who funds it. Yeah, exactly. Individual donor, I have uh, around uh, three, four thousand entire world. These people sending me. Any companies? Yes. Uh, no, I don't have any companies. So you're fussy about yeah, who I, donates? Still, still, I don't get any support from NGOs and NGOs. So I just accept only uh, the individual donation. Why do you do that? Uh, because. Uh, NGO and INGO has their own vision, and I have also vision. And his vision only seems to get bigger. Uttam has plans for rapid expansion. So in entire Nepal there are 75 districts, and I try to uh, build 75 schools in 15 years. Wow. So yeah, uh, it's uh, my mission, and uh, definitely one day I'll build one big university called Bamboo University. A bamboo university, bamboo as, well. university as well. We're standing on the site of what will become Uttam's first bamboo hospital. He hopes it will provide cheap health care for his students, plenty of whom aspire to train as doctors and nurses. This is the fundamental rights of kids, you know, when kids take birth, education and health, you know. This is real enjoyment, which comes from heart. So when it's come, whole body are enjoying. So this is called internal happiness. So I am, I got this. Happy he may be, but it doesn't pay the bills. Uttam can't get regular funding to pay his teachers because of his suspicion of large donors and contempt for their reporting practices. Teaching at this school is different than teaching at other schools. Everyone knows the bamboo school. All the teachers are motivated because we feel we are doing something for the country. We take minimum salary. Others even volunteer from bigger schools. But the students are disciplined and do a good job in return. But at one school in the far east of the country, staff recently staged a walkout. Yeah, it's very difficult. Sometimes now, now I, I, I could not pay my teachers last five months, you know. The big festival is going on. Now I'm in big pressure. So big trouble to how to give them salary. But I, yeah, I'll, I'll manage. At home with our aspiring doctor, Pema, we learn that parents are making sacrifices too. When Pema's father refused to let her go to school, her mother left him to make sure her daughter got a good education. I didn't get a chance to study, and life is hard for me. And that's why I decided to do everything I can to send my children to school. Struggling with three children on her own, she decided to put her two sons in a monastery school in India so she could afford to keep Pema at the bamboo school. My wage was barely enough to keep them here. Last year, I fell ill. Everyone said I would die. 
Pema knows she needs to do well. I feel very sorry. I don't know what I feel. I say to my dad, you are wrong. Your thinking was wrong and you have to be educated at first to know the problems. So I will want to say to my dad like that. Government schools in Nepal are free, but the dropout rates, especially among girls, are much higher. My name is Solomi Pahari. I study in class 7 and live in Bodikale village, ward number 7, Lalitpur. There are seven people in my family, my father, mother, two sisters, two brothers and myself. We all live together. When I was 10 years old, I used to work as a maid in a house in Kathmandu. I tried to go to school while I was working, but I couldn't study. The culture around here is that boys are given more importance than girls, and most of the time the boys are sent to school. The general attitude is that the girls get married and go to their husband's home, and there is no need to educate them. In a government school an hour outside of the capital, Kathmandu, Salome is trying her best to make up for four years of lost education. Determined not to live out her teenage years as a maid, she's only just returned to school. It was difficult to wake up that early and I was tired most of the time. Then I would start working. They saw how hard I worked but never appreciated my work and I felt I was weak. I would love to go to a private boarding school if my family didn't have any financial problems. In my opinion, there are too many difficulties and challenges in a government school. The buildings are not up to the standard and worn out. There are no windows and sometimes people, they just break down the doors. The toilets should be improved. As I'm new in the school, I really don't know if there is a shortage of teachers here. But because we are taught in Nepali, we are weak in English. With a translator, I visit some of the classes at Salome's school. Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 <laughs> Where's the teacher? Teacher, where is the teacher? Library. Okay, what are they supposed to be doing? English? English? It's an English period oh. right now. <laughs> we can help with that. What do they know in English? English They're too shy to speak any English. Yeah. <laughs> Nepal spends 17% of its gross domestic product on education. Teacher salaries take up the vast majority of the education budget and there's little left for books and better buildings. To be honest, it is difficult to motivate teachers here. And that's not just for me. I can't and I shouldn't hide that fact. Overall, in the context of Nepal, in practice, they say things are happening well. The current government claims that the education sector is doing great and climbing heights, but in reality, the people have received nothing and things are far worse than it really appears. In Nepal, it's common for the government to appoint teachers on political grounds, but hard to remove those who underperform. Foreign aid money is also misused because donations are made to programs that do not suit the schools. Well, in the press we see actually uh, huge corruption in the education sector and the corruption in different ways, not only taking bribe directly, the way teachers are recruited, promoted, transferred here and there. Okay. The politicization of Nepal's education system doesn't stop at teacher appointments. Strikes, known as banned, are often called by politically affiliated groups. If schools do not shut, they're attacked by vandals. Political groups also ask for ransom money from private schools. 
we don't want to fight with them in, for the safety and health of the children, so we close schools, but we don't give them money. Rato Bangla is one of Kathmandu's most prestigious schools. It's been shut for at least 15 days this year because of strikes. A school bus was burned after the school resisted paying bribes. No one was hurt. We don't know what kind of politics this is, you know, like attacking children, attacking school buses, what kind of a leadership this is and what they are, what they are teaching the next generation to do as they grow up. The quality of teaching and education is taken very seriously here. When there is a strike, uh, like beginning of the session, that disturbs a lot because you're just about to come to school and there are strikes and you cannot come. And that hampers our studies. I'm Prachi Adhikari. I'm 13 years old and I study in Ratha Bangla, Grade 8. I really feel lucky because I think that Ratha Bangla has such a nice facility for students, like the studies and all are really great. And my hobbies are painting, I just love painting, and then singing, dancing. Art for me is a way of expressing my feelings. When I'm angry or anything, I just uh, pour it out in a paper and form of art. I've been doing art since I was a child. I have a deep interest in it. Rato Bangla is more than an exclusive school. 18% of the fees paid by students here go to teacher training for government teachers. The most important individual in a school is a teacher. And if teachers are trained well, you know, the classroom will run well and the children will benefit from education. These teachers from rural areas of Nepal will take skills back to their classrooms. It's hoped that improving the quality of teachers will slow the alarming student dropout rates in government schools. 95% of Nepali children enrol in Grade 1, but only 7 out of 10 will make it to Grade 5. Over half will drop out before they reach high school, leaving only 4 in 10 enrolled in the 10th grade. Even fewer finish school to Grade 12. The main reason is poverty. We travel to the Terai region in southern Nepal to see the quality of education in one of the poorest areas of the country. It's 9am on a school day. In this part of Nepal, the caste system is still alive and well. These children are part of the lowest caste, known as untouchables, and none go to school. We meet Sunena and her family on the outskirts of a village in Berganj. Of the 14 people who live in her house, no one has been educated. She spends her day doing chores and weaving bamboo to sell in the village. We meet her mother. Yeah, she's saying uh, Sunena doesn't go to school. Why? And the reason is like there is prejudice that happens to her because other kids in the school think that uh, she belongs to an untouchable task. So if the teachers allowed it, she would send Sunena to school? Does she have anything she would like to be when she grows up? She's never thought about it, she says. The cycle of poverty is hard to break without education. Even if Sunena overcomes the prejudice of her classmates and teachers and goes to school, the level of education she would receive would be far below that of the rest of the country. Every village in the area is mired in poverty and the distance between schools is vast. In remote areas of Nepal, there are very few schools and the ones that do exist have poor infrastructure, even though they're supposed to get the same amount of funding per child as every other government school. Some locals have told us about some classes that are operating outdoors because the school can't afford to build classrooms. This is the Bhagashwari Titrana School. 
Locally, it's known as a sack school because children have to sit on sacks under a tree. There is a fragile shelter that parents built themselves and a few small school benches. We didn't receive funds from the government and so we raised money from the village to build this hut for the school so that our children can study. There are two teachers who don't even receive their salaries. There is lack of everything here. Sheikh Ful Muhammad is a rice farmer who has two daughters and one son in the Sack School. He tells us it's not true that government schools are free. He has to buy books which cost $5 a month on average. He would gladly send his children to a bamboo school if there was one here. Politicians and the education office are weak. We are poor men, we don't have access and we know nothing. We've been raising protests for the past five or six years. They always say that our request is in the process. We even met them, but nothing happens. We are helpless and we are neglected. Funding for schools is determined by the number of students. Narayan Prasad Gamir is the president of a school management committee in the nearby Bara district. It's his job to verify the number of students, which determines the per child funding from the government. Some kids that don't even come at all. He admits he has to increase the numbers so that the school can afford to pay teachers. At our school, in the register, there are 120 students enrolled, but on an average, in a daily basis, 60 to 70 students come. He says officials in the district education office refuse to release money for books and new classrooms unless they're paid bribes. To make them happy, we have to pay bribes. There is widespread corruption here. The amount of corruption in the education sector in this Bara district is more than anywhere. The government claims 7 million students go to school and university in Nepal, a country of 30 million. But many doubt this figure, especially seeing as classrooms we've visited, like this one, have a lot more students enrolled than actually attend. Some schools close because there are not enough students. The buildings lie empty. A recent report by UNESCO and the Education Department says Nepal is unlikely to achieve the Millennium Development Goal of primary education for all children by 2015. I asked the education minister, a former teacher, about corruption in the education system. What we need to understand is that there are a lot of issues that are rotten in the education system since multi-party democracy was introduced in this country in 1990. And it takes time to clean all of this. He says the government has taken measures like putting money directly in teachers' bank accounts and sacking district education officers found to be misusing money. But he denies private schools are doing a better job, dollar for dollar, of teaching children in Nepal. If we really look at it like that, then students studying in a village government school may have a lot of knowledge and may have a different perception of things than the students from a bamboo school. The debate over private versus public education will go on in Nepal, but across the country's social and economic divide, the aspirations remain the same. I want to say to that God, if you want to be a good student of the, and a good citizens of Nepal, you have to come in this bamboo school and you have to read hard. I would like to help small kids and start an orphanage. I'm interested in social work. I want to help my country and be a successful person. And that's enough to make one man continue to hope. One day, uh, my kids will become a good politician and run this country very nicely. I hope so.